Romans, kind of chapter by chapter, and uh, it's a long book, and so uh, we kind of broke up the book Romans into three parts, and we finished part one uh, last week, and so after the first of the year, we're going to get back to our Roman study. Um, but we're going to take a little break for December, these five Sundays in December, and do kind of a short series, series on heaven. And let me get my clicker here. Um, and uh, this series really had its birth in um, a young adult retreat I did for the Thrive, the Thrive Young Adults. Uh, we did a retreat in September, and they asked me to speak on heaven. I'd never taught on heaven, never preached on heaven before, so I, it was a really rich study for me just to kind of go through that, and I thought I'd probably develop that, those teachings into a series for One Hope. I thought I would probably do that this summer, um, but as I got to thinking about it, there really is no more uh, really appropriate topic for the season of Advent uh, than this topic of heaven. Uh, if you don't know, the word Advent actually it simply means coming. Uh, at the, as in the advent of Jesus, the coming of Jesus. And so we look forward during this season to the, the coming of Jesus at Christmas time. Uh, but those churches that actually celebrate a season of Advent, what they'll often do is during the Sundays leading up to Christmas, read passages and sometimes uh, kind of preach on the passages about Jesus' second advent, his second coming. And, uh, and, 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 just, and when that happens, when Jesus comes again, his second coming, his second advent, uh, he will raise us up to new life, and we will enter into that state uh, into which we will be for all eternity. In other words, it will be heaven. And so heaven is the topic for our, our kind of advent uh, season this year. And uh, I've kind of given, this is kind of this first message, a little bit of introduction, hints from the heart about heaven, but I've subtitled it The Hope of Heaven. We're going to look at hope this morning, and it just so happens that the first candle uh, in Advent is the candle of hope. And so the hope of heaven is going to be our focus uh, this morning. So why don't we just bow our heads and uh, close our eyes, and let's begin with a word of prayer. You can first pray that I light this candle Good job. Well done. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, so much. Um, I just pray that you would bless this study as we just really kind of dive in and, and study the, this, this topic of heaven. But I pray that this would be more than just an academic exercise, that, that through this time, uh, that you would stir something in us that, that we would actually latch on to a, a real expectation of what's to come, uh, such that it really changes how we look at life how we feel about life and, and, uh, and, and how we live our life as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, when I was a kid, about five years old, I experienced a terrible, traumatic tragedy. Some kid stole my G.I. Joe orange jumpsuit. Do they even have G.I. Joes anymore today? I don't even know that. But so there was this new kid on the block. I didn't know him very well. We were in my bedroom and about five years old and we we're playing with our G.I. Joes and he said, could I borrow your, the orange G.I. Joe jumpsuit? And I said, sure. Next day I saw him and I said, can I have the orange jumpsuit back? And he said, what, what jumpsuit? Oh, that's my orange jumpsuit. He just pretended like I never lent it to him that it was his. And I didn't know what to do. I was flabbergasted. I was distraught. This was my first encounter with injustice and evil in this world. And so I just, I just went home. I don't think I even told my parents. I just went to my room. I was distraught. I was depressed. I, kinda, I, I was just kind of, you know, felt wounded. Um, but then, in my little five-year-old mind, I, I said, you know what, Peter? Someday, you're going to be in heaven, and this won't matter. And immediately, I was no longer sad, and I had this sure hope, this crazy eternal perspective that completely changed how I felt in that moment. I wish I could tell you that I still operate like that today. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that when disappointments for me happen in life, when struggles happen, I wish I could I'd just tell myself, Peter, don't worry about it. Someday it'll be in heaven, and this won't matter. That doesn't work anymore. And I asked myself the question, why is that? What changed? How did I lose that hope of a child's perspective? And it's not that I stopped believing. I, I still believe. 
But I guess if, if I'm honest, it's maybe that my faith got sophisticated. You know, I went to seminary and I learned that things are a little more complicated uh, than maybe the simplistic view that we have as, as a child. I still have hope. I still have a hope of heaven, but it's kind of a vague hope. And I don't think I'm alone in this. I think many Christians today, uh, we have a hope of heaven, but, but it's kind of a vague hope. It doesn't really change our lives that much, thinking about heaven. Maybe a little bit, but it certainly doesn't change how we feel uh, about life. Uh, it, uh, we, we have hope, but it's a kind of a vague hope. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. Number one, I think just the picture that we have of heaven, typically, it's not that appealing. I mean, in our misguided attempts to kind of make heaven feel spiritual, like more spiritual than this life, we picture heaven as just kind of this ethereal place on some kind of non-physical plane. Everything's white. You know, we're just having, it's one long eternal choir practice and we're prouncing around in diapers, playing our harps, listening to Morgan Freeman read the dictionary all day or something (laughs) like that. Not very appealing. That's kind of the picture that many of us, something like that of, of heaven, kind of a static existence. Second reason I think that our hope of heaven is kind of a vague hope is, and this is maybe more my issue, but I see that heaven is not picturable. That, that we read descriptions of heaven in the Bible and we kind of see them, I see them sometimes, and well, you know, heaven, whatever it really is, it's beyond our imagination. So there's just a lot of symbolism in the Bible to di- try to describe something that is just indescribable in our current frame or our current context. And so, we, you know, it's things that I used to view kind of literally as a child, I, now, I just see it as more symbolic of something else that we can't really wrap our brains around in our earthly context. And, and the the proof text that I use for this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where uh, somebody asked Jesus, you know, or Paul, uh, with what kind of bodies will we be raised? And Paul basically says, or this is how I've, I've a little bit misinterpreted, uh, there's truth here, but I think I've taken it too far, that our, in our resurrected state, we're going to be as different from what we are now as a seed is from the tree that comes from that seed. He kind of uses that analogy, and but I think I've taken it a little too far, but how I typically will apply that, or even I'll share sometimes at funerals, I'll, I'll talk, I'll use an analogy, I'll say, um, you know, there really is no afterlife, this is the before life, real life is coming, and it's kind of like in this life, it's like we're in the womb, and, and, and when we die, it's like we're birthed into the real world, but, you know, if, if you were, try, if you were in the real world, and you ha- w- tried to go to an embryo in the womb and explain to them what a tree looks like, or explain to them what a ball looks like or an airplane, you would have to do so in terms that they could understand in their experience, right, in the womb. So you might say, well, the trunk of a tree, it's a little bit like that umbilical cord sticking out of your belly, or a ball, it's kind of like the placenta. You know, there's not much you have to go on, but maybe you'd kind of have to use some different uh, kind of analogies to, to describe that. And I think there's truth there, but I think I've, I think I've misimplied that. I think I've taken it too far because I actually do think that there are um, a lot of frame of reference in our current world that we can tap into to actually picture heaven. And it's important because you can't really desire something you can't picture. You, you can't really get your heart set on something that you can't truly imagine. And so we're going to look at why that I was a little bit wrong on that, I think, as we kind of go through the study. But just, I think that's one of the reasons why at least I have a, a vague hope. I can't picture it, so it's hard to long for it as like in a real thing. It just feels too other for me. And then there's a third factor, I think. Um, and again, maybe this is my deal, but heaven is, at least for me sometimes, thinking about heaven, it's more of a motivating fear factor. Um, in other words, my thinking about you know, heaven and the afterlife is more in terms of, well, I better make the most of my time down here because it'll be all up then and I'll, one day I'm going to appear before Jesus and, and uh, he's gonna, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, whatever that is. Now, I think it's actually good to do that. I think it's good to think about our mortality, to think about death, uh, and use that to motivate us to, to make the most of our, of our time, uh, make the most of our, you know, how we live our, our life, and um, um, keep us humble. Um, and actually, others have done this too. Ancient merchants used to write on their ledger books, uh, uh, um, uh, memento mori, it's Latin for, for think of death. 
just to kind of keep themselves honest that they would also have to give an account one day. Uh, Philip of Macedon, he was the father of Alexander the Great. He actually commissioned one of his slaves to, to stand in his presence every day and say, Philip, you are going to die. That was his job, just to remind him of his mortality. I've got a plaque on my wall. I've had it ever since I was confirmed. It says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last to me to live is Christ. And so I think of death and the afterlife and of going to heaven and appearing before God, and I use that as a motivating factor for how I spend my time, what I'm investing in, and that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to do, but... That kind of motivation, more out of fear, even if it's a healthy fear of of missing out, a fear of wasting time or opportunities, fear of maybe kind of getting my hand slapped by Jesus on the last day, I I I know I'm saved, I know I'm going to go to heaven, but but maybe Jesus, he's just going to be a little disappointed in me, I'll get a little bit of scolding on that day because I wasted some of that time, and and so that fear of of that uh, is kind of a motivating factor. that can help, maybe, a little bit, but not that much. Fear is simply not a good enough motivator. What we need, what I need, is hope. Not a vague hope, but a real hope, a sure hope. Now just think about that word hope for a minute. I mean, obviously we're talking about the hope of heaven here, but just put heaven aside for a moment. Everybody needs hope. And it seems to be that in this day and age, in the culture and, and in the place of history that we're in, we're, 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 we are in a, in a time where we're experiencing, I think, a crisis of hope in our world today. Uh, the rate of antidepressants have act- actually skyrocketed through the roof in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Antidepressants have become the third most common prescription drug. Uh, now, I believe in medication, um, but I think it says something about us when depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. And suicides have also just skyrocketed. Depending on what country you're looking at, it's either the first or second leading cause of death among young people. Suicide is. We appear to be experiencing in our day and age a crisis of hope. And I'm, I'm not, of course, I'm not talking about wishful thinking kind of hope, like I hope it doesn't rain today. I'm not talking about just being more optimistic. I'm not talking about a vague hope. We need a sure hope, the kind of hope that actually really gets you excited about your future. Because having that kind of hope, it's incredibly practical because how you view your future impacts your current experience. I mean, think of the, the kids who wake up uh, for, for on, in September um, you know, with, with the whole school year ahead of them feel very differently about waking up than the kid in June who knows that summer vacation is just a couple days away. Or the woman who's just been served her divorce papers feels very different about life than the woman who wakes up two days before her wedding. How we feel about our future has enormous consequences for our hearts right now. So let me ask you, how's your heart? How's your hope these days? What are the things that you're hoping in? What are the things that you're looking forward to? Are there areas in your life where you feel like you've lost hope? Or what are the hardest 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 aspect of holding on to hope in every circumstance and and is there really a sure hope that we can have that actually can give us the strength and 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 the uh, the endurance to overcome even the the worst catastrophes and struggles of life and of course the christian answer is heaven the hope of heaven will do that right but if i'm honest as i think about that the hope of heaven here's what that translates to. Here's what that really means. But the hope of heaven means this. Someday you are going to die and you're going to, all the things that you really hope for in this life, good things that you hope for in this life, you're going to lose all those things. But don't worry, you're going to go to heaven and you're going to be with Jesus and all of us and we're going to have one long church service for all eternity. Now, I'm a pastor, so it's my job description to like church, right? And so so I do like church. I like to worship, but 
the, the idea that we're just going to kind of, you know, that uh, everything, you know, that everything I love in this world is kind of going to get burned up as we're whisked away uh, to heaven and, and we're going to you know, be in, this, in, in that place of heaven forever, but everything we truly love in this world is just going to get burned up. And, and so, but you've got to just let go of those things, focus on heaven. If I'm honest, it doesn't really excite me. It doesn't make me, it, it doesn't move me. It, there, there's, there isn't for me a really kind of hope that changes the way I look at life. And, and it seems to go against what my heart desires too, what my heart is saying. Now, I'm not one that says you should just follow your heart. Our heart is deceptively wicked. It can mislead us in all kinds of ways, but we are created in the image of God. And I think God has implanted God-given desires in our hearts. And, and so some of those God-given desires in our hearts that he created our hearts, I think he implanted God-given desires that I think some of those give us a hint regarding the thing that you're made for and so the thing that you should be hoping for, believing that what you are made for is the thing that God is going to give you because he wants to give you that thing that he's implanted in your heart as a hope of what's to come. And, and what is that thing that you're made for? Drum roll, please. That thing is, you were made for the kingdom. Now, I know that sounds a bit anticlimactic. Oh, that sounds very spiritual. You're made for the kingdom of God. It's anticlimactic because we tend to spiritualize the kingdom and, and we make it in this kind of ethereal thing. It's like a concept. But what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is God coming and restoring everything that's broken, transforming everything that is wrong about this world into what he designed it to be and, and doing the same for yourselves, eradicating the, our brokenness and, and bringing us to new life. That's really the meaning of the kingdom. It's about God. God's perfect design, uh, him bringing that to you and to me. And what is God's perfect design? It is and has always been you created with a physical body in a physical universe, but perfect without sin and with God's kingdom, his rule, his, his protection, uh, his, governance, uh, his presence with you and in you and around you. And we desire to live in that kind of dynamic, our heart's desire to live forever in a world, a real world, but without corruption, without pain, but that still has adventure, still has growth, still has, has love, still has relationships. We don't see it now, but we long for it. And that hint from our hearts, I think, tells us something about what we are made for and what we should hope for. C.S. Lewis once said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And I think that this hunger of our hearts for this other world that Lewis talks about is one reason why, why fantasy books and novels are so popular today and why, uh, and why video game sales of, of particularly fantasy role-playing games are, are just, you know, have gone through the roof in sales, you know, you know, these worlds like, you know, the Elder Scrolls, Witcher, Zelda, Baldur's Gate, all those games that probably most of you have never even heard of are, are just incredibly popular today. And I think the reason for their wild popularity goes way beyond escapism. Rather, the kingdoms found in those games touch the very hunger in our souls that God made for this other world that we are made for and that we secretly long for. But those are, of course, hints from our hearts. Our hearts can give us hints, but not solid answers. So what does the Bible actually say about heaven? And... What is actually the, what is the thing that, G, that has actually been promised to us by God about this world that our hearts long for? Um, well, that's actually what this whole rest of the series is going to be about, but let me just give you a, kind of a little uh, teaser of kind of uh, some clues to get us started to kind of see where we're, we're going in the weeks to come. Uh, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 28 to 30, um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Jesus said this, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne. What's he talking about there? He's talking about his second advent, when he comes again. It's judgment day, it's the end, and it's the day of the, of the resurrection, of our resurrection, and he calls that day, in other words, it's, it's, it's our final destiny, it's heaven. What he calls that day, he calls it the renewal of all things. 
The Greek word there is palgenesia. It literally means Genesis again, back to Genesis. Jesus promised not some kind of weird, kind of, kind of different ex- existence that we have no way of relating to right now. He promised the renewal the restoration of everything you love right here in this life, minus the sin, minus the curse. John Eldridge writes this, despite what you've been told, he, Jesus, didn't focus our hopes on the great airlift to heaven. He promised the renewal of all things. And Isaiah gives a prophetic vision of what's to come. He says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And... uh, Next week, we're going to start to to kind of see how what God has promised us, new earth that he has promised us, it's not a different earth, but it is our present earth, made new, renewed, restored, and redeemed. And uh, and we're going to look at a lot more that next week, but here's just a few hints of of how that is the case. um, Jesus, when he came 2,000 years ago preaching, he preached the kingdom. He preached the coming of the kingdom. He says the kingdom is, is here, the kingdom is near, and there's this dynamic both then and now in our day and age that the kingdom is here, but it's not yet fully here. And We pray, thy kingdom come. It's not yet fully here. One day it will be, but in Jesus' day, as he walked this earth, he gave us a foretaste of the kingdom. And how did he do that? Through his miracles. His miracles were signs of the kingdom. What did he do? He healed the, a blind man. He restored his sight didn't create some different way of seeing. He he, he, he healed, he restored the sight of the blind man. He he helped people who couldn't walk to to walk again. They were miracles of of restoration. And he was giving a foretest taste of the complete restoration that is to come. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. This is how the whole story ends. This is how the, the, the history ends with these words. And he, Jesus, who was seated on the throne, said, Behold, I am making all things new. Not making new things, making all things new again. But wait a minute, the theologically sophisticated out there among you. Isn't the earth supposed to be destroyed by fire? Well, yes, actually. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, the, actually, in many places, it does say that the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. Second Peter uh, 3, 5 to 7 is one of them. It talks about the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire. So yes, the present earth will be destroyed by fire. But does destroyed mean annihilated? Because actually, even just in this passage, just in a couple in the verse before, he talks about the flood. How how the, at one time the, the world was God destroyed the world with a flood. Did he annihilate the world? No, he destroyed the world with a flood. And afterwards, you could say after the flood there was a renewal. Uh, so also here, the world will be destroyed by fire. But God will once again, and this time finally and fully, make it new again, resurrect it, restore it, and heal it. And actually, Peter himself actually alludes to this in the same passage, just a couple verses later, he says that we're waiting for a new earth. His focus is on the new earth that is to come. And actually, in one of Peter's sermons, in Acts chapter 3, Peter says this, he says, Heaven must receive him, Jesus, until the time comes for God to restore everything. That word restore everything, it's, it's the Greek word apokatastasis, and it literally means to restore to its original state. God, in the beginning, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, he created the universe good. He created heaven and earth, and he he created it with real molecules, a physical earth, physical universe, and us with real molecules and as physical beings, and what did he call it? He called it very good. It was his plan, his design, yet, yet we became broken, we sinned, the universe became broken, earth became cursed and broken, but one day he is going to restore everything, he's going to raise us up to new life, and he's going to resurrect the earth as well. In fact, he's going to resurrect all of creation. That's the reason why I had uh, Margaret read that passage in Romans 8. Here's just part of it. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation, the earth, waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, the, kind of the culmination of all time when we're resurrected. For the, for the creation, the earth was subjected to futility. It's under the curse, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, you know, our sin, our brokenness, in hope that the creation itself, earth itself, will be set free 
from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It says that the creation, the earth, is going to be set free, not annihilated. It's going to be renewed, restored, cleansed, set free, just as we will one day be. And there's no greater picture of this reality, uh, uh, this, this physical, basically, of kind of the physical nature of the coming reality, both for us and our coming world, uh, than the resurrection appearances of Jesus. If you want to know what is your resurrected body going to be like, the resurrected Jesus is our best picture of, of what it's like. And what's most remarkable about Jesus is, and his resurrection appearances was how normal they were. I mean, yeah, he could walk through walls, so we're talking about an upgrade here. Uh, but he also, you know, he said, touch me and see that I'm not a ghost. He ate fish. He sat by a campfire. He had conversation. They could recognize him. They talked to each other. There was, uh, there was relationship. Jesus' restored life is surprisingly like his former life. The most striking thing about the post-resurrection appearances was that they were so remarkably ordinary. For too long, we Christians have misunderstood our destiny. We've thought that the world, that we would leave the earth, that we would kind of, kind of go to this ethereal in heaven, leave everything that we truly love about uh, this world while the earth is destroyed. But that is not the hope that is offered us by God. And we need hope. Hebrews 6.19 says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. The context there is the promises of God and what are the promises of God? It is a resurrected you in a resurrected earth. And that is something I can wrap my brain around. I can picture that and it's that kind of hope. As I grow in that hope, as maybe we grow in that hope through this series and kind of study it and meditate on it, and is this really true? As we dig into that, that kind of hope is what actually can give you the motivation for life far greater than the fear factor ever could. I grew up in um, San Pedro, California. It's kind of the harbor area of L.A., uh, and about 26 miles off the coast of uh, San Pedro is Catalina Island on a clear day. You can see it. It's beautiful. Uh, but often there's a marine layer. It's, it's really foggy. Well, Randy Alcorn, he tells a story of how in 1952, a young Florence Chadwick uh, stepped onto the waters of the Pacific Ocean off Catalina Island. She was determined to swim from Catalina to the mainland of California. She had already swum the English Channel, both way. She was the first woman uh, to do so. And so on this day, she kind of got in the water off Catalina. It was a foggy day. It was chilly. Uh, she could hardly see the boats that were accompanying her. And, uh, but still, she kind of swam for about 15 hours. And when she would beg to be taken out of the water, she wanted to give up. You know, her mom was in the boat, said, just hang in there. You're going to make it. You can, you can do it. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, but, so she kept going. But finally, just physically, and emotionally exhausted, she gave up. She stopped swimming, and they pulled her out, of the boat, out into the boat. It was only after she was in the boat that she found out that she was only a half mile from shore. And later at the press conference, she said, I just I couldn't see a thing. And she said, I think if I, if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. If we could just see the shore and picture it and focus it, it will give us the extra strength to make it, to endure. Jonathan Edwards, great theologian of a few centuries ago, he said, he wrote a lot about heaven and he was always talking about the new earth when he's talking about heaven. Uh, he wrote this one time about focusing on the hope of heaven all the time. He said, it becomes us to spend this life only as a journey toward heaven to which we should subordinate all other concerns of life. Why should we labor for or set our hearts on anything else but that which is our proper end and true happiness? And this is not about escapism. You know, some might push back and say, you know, you know why spend all this time thinking about heaven? You know, you know, don't think so much about heaven that you're of no earthly good. You heard that phrase? It's actually the opposite that's the case. The more you focus on heaven as in a renewed and resurrected new earth with creatures who will live forever, it only motivates us to care for our present earth and, and people who will not be annihilated but, but one day made new. C.S. Lewis writes this, if you read history, 
you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were not just those who thought, uh, who, the, the, the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. And so that's our series that we're going to be going through. This morning has been kind of more of an introduction. Uh, next week, we're going to look at seven truths from the Bible about heaven. And then the week after that, kind of continue with that, but more focusing on what Jesus said about heaven. And then Christmas Eve, we're going to have Christmas Eve service, 4 p.m. Uh, no Sunday morning service, but 4 p.m. afternoon candlelight service. And uh, I'll weave heaven into it, but it'll be a standalone sermon. Invite your friends and family uh, just to come to that. It'll be a, it will be a, it'll be a Christmas Eve message. And, uh, and then December 31st, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to kind of, hopefully I can pull this off, do a talk on evidence from science and reason about heaven. It's actually fascinating as I've been digging into this. Hopefully I'll be able to articulate this well. But uh, uh, basically, just how can a modern person believe in an immaterial soul and, and, or the immortality of the soul and, and things like heaven and hell? We'll, we'll dig into that as well. So my, my goal in this whole series is that this vague hope of heaven that most of us have that doesn't really do much to change our lives or affect how we feel would by the end of this series be transformed into a sure hope that changes absolutely everything. And, and that you would actually, it would actually impact how you live your life and how you feel about life right now. I want heaven for you and for me to be something that we are excited about, even giddy about. Uh, when Hannah, my oldest daughter over here, was nine years old, she got her first iPod. She w wanted this thing so bad, and uh, she, she had the money for it, and so I, I helped her buy it online, and we got the receipt, and we got the tracking number, and then we waited, and we waited. It was so hard to wait for this new iPod, and Hannah would go out to the mailboxes in Minnesota. She'd go out to the mailbox across the street and check it and be disappointed, walk back into this every day. Finally, the day came. She, she went out, and I was looking out the window because I think I knew it was coming that day, and uh, she kind of like, you know, just nonchalantly opened it up, and it was there. And oh my goodness, she lit up, she grabbed it, she ran back to the house like, it's here, it's here, it's here. <laughs> I want you to close your eyes right now. I want you to picture something as we close here. The day's gonna come that there's gonna be a morning and you're gonna wake up and sunlight will be coming in through the curtains. And you will hear the sound of resurrected birds singing in the garden. Delicious smells of a renewed and perfect summer will waft in on the breeze. And as you open your rebuilt eyes, you will realize how young and whole your body feels. There will be no tormenting thoughts that will rush in to assault you. And as you sit up to look around the bedroom that Jesus prepared for you, you will see it filled with light and you will hear the sounds of laughter and running water outside, and you will suddenly realize it's here. And you're, you'll rush outside. Maybe we'll all rush outside at that moment, and we'll kind of stare at one another in our resurrected bodies, and we will all cry out together, it's here, it's here, it's here. Only that kind of hope can serve as the anchor for the soul that we all need. Amen.